Hello, welcome back to another pen talk. Thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to revisit um, pen from Fountain Pen Revolutions. It's a Himalaya pen. Those of you that watch my channel may uh, remember the Ebonite one that I did a little uh, bit ago, a few weeks ago. And also at that time I got um, an Indus pen with a flex nib and I had some challenges with it, so I figured I wanted to try the flex nib with an ebonite feed. Some people said that that worked very well, so we got a Himalaya pen. And I was interested in this orange acrylic, and it is uh, definitely orange. So uh, while it's rotating in front of you and, and moving a little bit, we're going to dive in, take a look at this pen, ink it up, see how it writes, and see if... This flex nip with an ebonite feed hits it out of the park. So with all the acrylics in the Himalaya pens, this one is certainly very nice looking. Some interesting chatoyancy there. You know, we got plain ends, but the way it's machined, you get to really appreciate... Uh, the nuances and this black and kind of a yellow orange. I wouldn't call it a pure orange, but I'm not one to be the judge of colors without some type of reference. You know, you have the FPR stamped into that cap band, and I would say that that could be done a little better, but again, this is not an expensive pen. A functional stamped clip, you know, held down by this top finial. The cap unscrews with about two turns. Section the same material as the rest of the pen, which I really uh, enjoy. And then we have the number five Ultra Flex nib that Kevin has worked with with an ebonite feet on the back. So this is going to be an interesting one to try. It's as soft as the one I had before. I also have a number six with an ebonite feed, but I'm uh, challenged to find a pen for it to fit in, but I will work on it, and hopefully you'll get to see that in action in a little bit. Weeks, maybe. The Himalaya Post, but not real deeply, but it's a light pen, and it, it fits well in the hand. I think the section is a nice, uh, girthy section. You got a lot of places to hold. You can feel the threads, but they're not sharp. So you can really hold the pen almost anywhere. It's a cartridge converter, which could be used as an eyedropper. It has a push-pull converter, which is not my favorite. But it does work. And what's nice is it's threaded onto the back of the section in a nice little O-ring there at the bottom which is going to seal well, but I'm also going to put silicone grease on these threads. It doesn't hurt. And I just really enjoy that chatoyancy. So let's get this puppy inked up. So one thing is um, interesting is to compare acrylics from two different places. I'm assuming these come from two different sources. Here's that Pen BBS one, which I've really enjoyed. This is definitely on the yellow side, uh, the same type of black, even more intense black. And this has more pearlescence in it, which shows the chatoyancy in many different places. And these are just two complete pieces of acrylic. So it definitely makes the uh, Fountain Pen Revolution pen to be on the orange. No doubt about that. And there is a similar chatoyancy. There's a little bit more depth to the Fountain Pen Revolution. It's probably a different uh, grade of mica that's used to give it that uh, depth and pearlized look. But it's still two uh, really nice acrylics and two really nice pens. Now for the pen comparison. The Himalaya is... Um, pretty girthy compared to these other pens, your Metropolitan, your 78G, and your All-Star. So let's take a look at section and nib. 
Uh, posted, um, and all these pens uh, post fairly well. The uh, Lamy All-Star, which is pretty much the same size as the Safari, is obviously the longest of this group. Um, the Himalaya is second, and then your 70, uh, your Metropolitan is third, and your 78G is the shortest. So let's zero in on the functional part. The Himalaya section is by far the girthiest, largest diameter section. It's also the shortest, but these threads are okay, so you can hold it anywhere here. And that flare out at the end is is nice. I enjoy that. All of these these two have a flare out, and this one has a flare out, but it stops short of uh, this little extension here, which is what's used to seal into the cap liner. Um, these are all in the range of number five nibs. Um, you know, the Lamy is obviously a unique size into itself with that slip-on nib. The Pilot nib is the one with the little wings on the back. Um, and then you got your 5.5 as defined by Kevin at FPR that's in the Himalaya. Obviously, the only one with an ebonite feed is the Himalaya. So enough with the comparisons. So let's put nib to paper. Here we are comparing the acrylic Himalaya to the ebonite Himalaya. You know, it is the same pen made out of two different materials, which is an interesting combination. The acrylic one is a couple millimeters longer overall. And they both have that FPR in the cap band. Clips are the same. Posted the acrylic is... Um, a lot longer. I guess it has to do with dimensions and shapes and things of that nature, but it's not something that I kind of anticipated. So I swapped caps just to see exactly what the difference is in posting, and the ebonite has a narrower end to the barrel than the acrylic does, so therefore, even though these caps have the same inside diameter, it posts more deeply on the ebonite barrel. The sections are very similar. It says the Ultraflex nib, which we'll get into the writing of that, but this one has just a fine uh, nib. Both of these have a slight odor to it. At this point in time, the acrylic odor is slightly stronger, but then probably in the next week or two, they'll both be fairly mild from uh, an odor viewpoint. So for those that are sensitive to that, uh, hopefully it's something that goes away if you do have one of these pens. And yes, you can make Franken pens. The caps fit and um, screw on to the barrels very well. So you could buy a number of Himalayas and make your own Franken pens. And with the variety of nibs that they have, um, Franken pens with many different types of nibs. So what ink to put in, this has been my go-to ink recently. Uh, I love the green. It's a uh, glitter ink from Pen BBS, uh, number 277, Forgive Green. Here's the bottle. Nice uh, octagonal bottle, nice wide opening. And as you can see, a lot of glitter. But it still flows well, and I've used this in a number of pens and been very happy. Before we put it to paper, I thought we'd take a look at some of the ink characteristics. Here's the chromatography on the Pen BBS 277. You know, it looks a little bit light. You can catch a little bit of that glitter down at the bottom, but it's very mild. You look at my color card. This was written with the Himalaya pen. You know, this is with the Q-tip. And again, you can catch some sparkle in that. And then this is put down with a scalpel, which is going to give you a much denser amount of ink. And again, the sparkle is, is interesting, and it just adds another dimension to it, but I don't think it overpowers. Let's take a look at how the ink looks inside the converter. And then as you can see, we do have... A lot of the glitter in there. I haven't had an issue with this ink in any other pens. I've probably put it in about four or five other pens. So 
Let's put this nib to paper and see how it works out in this pen. I think the flow is much better here. I haven't done anything other than flush the pen out. And it writes pretty consistent. If you're going to flex, you need to hold it at a higher angle because you can drag the feed on the paper. But that's a decent amount of flex for a modern steel nib that's very affordable. You can see where I dragged the feed. So that ink, uh, that nib is very close to the end of the feed. And, you know, I might move that feed back a little bit if I was to pull this apart. But I wanted to write with it as received. So it would be more indicative of if you receive the pen. Occasionally I have exhausted this feed, but it picks up, you know, within your 20 or 30 seconds. So that's still extremely better than what I experienced with this nib in, in the plastic feed in the Indus pen that I did a review of uh, a week or so ago. Yeah, it's about as good as you're going to get. And it, it requires, I would say, moderate pressure or a little bit more than moderate pressure. Certainly more pressure than that wonderful more nib in my uh, previous video but then this is modern steel flex and not vintage gold flex so overall see we, we ran out of ink which is strange this required some pressure so I'm going to rate this at a 9.2 you know, the quality of the pen is great, the aesthetics is good, the ergonomics is good, uh, the section works good, filling mechanism. You know, as a pen goes, this is as good as they get, and I would consider it a very good value. And now we're experiencing what I talked about before. I'm not really certain what's causing this, but this is what I used to get all the time with the plastic feed until I did a whole bunch of adjustments and then it wasn't as good as this one is. So we may have to drop down that rating because I haven't been, this hasn't been this severe that often. So maybe we'll move this. And I thought maybe we had done the priming. So one of the things that I notice if we take this all open is the ink seems to collect more towards the top. And I've pushed this down. You can see how far down this was originally all the way up to the top. So maybe um, this ink doesn't work well with this feed and nib combination. So as much as I enjoy this ink in this pen, we may have to try another ink before I really validate that rating. Yep, we're going to have to do something. So I went to this ink because I know it works well in a flex pen. It worked well in the more pen. When I was looking at this nib under the loop, the tines were misaligned and I couldn't get them aligned, so I pulled the nib and feed out. Easy to do with a gripper. Yeah, it's a decent Bakelite feed. There's a decent channel in there. Need to get the light right. You don't want it washed out by the white background. One of the things I find interesting is in the back of the nib, normally this groove is where you pull up ink from the converter, and normally this is all the way through, but here it isn't. So... It works okay. It draws up ink fine, so 
there's a decent channel on top that would uh, pull up a lot of ink. But when I look at this nib now, the tines seem to be aligned okay. There's a slight downturn, which might be one of the reasons when this nib is all the way in on the feed. So when I put this back together again, I'm going to give about a millimeter more clearance between the end of the feed and the end of the nib and see if that'll help out. But I put Robert Oster Gold Antiqua in here and uh, railroaded it even quicker than it did with the Pen BBS 277. So it's um, challenges of fountain pens. Yeah, my um, analysis of this Gold Antigua ink. Here's the chromatography. Interesting line of pink here with a dark line there. Whereas that's where I laid down the ink originally. And as you push up, you get some red, some orange, some brown, and actually at the very top, there's some green. So that's a very interesting combination, very intriguing chromatography. Here's my color card. Here's the swab with a Q-tip. Here's spatula. So you can see if the ink goes down really thick and, and wet, it's going to be much darker than if it's gone down a little bit lighter. And there's uh, the name written there in my schmear and my other hashtag. I've readjusted the nib. I took out that little bend at the end. The tines are still nice and close together. And I've been writing with it for a while and it writes okay. I haven't had any starvation, but I've not done any major flexing with it. So the conclusion that I can draw from this exercise is use this as a soft nib. But if you're going to flex, uh, be aware that you could have some challenges with that with flow issues and nib deformation. Let's put this new combination and let's get some ink on paper. Those skips are from me not keeping the pen on the paper. I mean, if you just use this nib as a soft nib, you put a little pressure on it, it opens up and the, and the flow becomes better. But, you know, don't try to flex it like I was doing up here. Um, again, it's the nature of the beast. And as we can see, for some reason, we starved out the feed again. And we weren't really doing that much to it. That recovered quickly, which is what I had experienced a little bit before until it got completely starved out. So I think that's an indication of, you know, this was some, you know, a little bit heavy writing and some a lot of ink flow, and then it got starved. And then 10 or 15 seconds later, the flow kind of resumed. So we're going to go back to rating again. And I have to drop this to an 8.4. I uh, applaud the efforts, but, you know, this is the second attempt to, of getting this nib to to work in a way that I'm comfortable with. But like I say, the, just use it like this. Don't push it, even though you can push it. As you can see, that's not going to work. I didn't do anything to the pen. I just let it set for a few minutes, and it's back writing. For a little bit again it's just the flow is just inconsistent so what i'm going to do is i got a a broad number five nib from uh, kevin what i'm going to do is i'm going to swap out the ultra flex for this 1.0 nib that i got from kevin in my order and let's see how this works and we'll see if it is a nib feed issue or a flow issue or just particularly an issue with that nib. A contributing cause could be the fact that ink gets hung up 
in this converter you can see it it should flow down gravity should pull it down but even if you tap it the ink there we go so that's not good you know maybe you need an agitator in there but that's obviously if the ink is not down there in touch with the feed from the converter it's going to dry out so now that we have it down there let's give this a 1.0 nib a run for its money So the first thing that I notice is this is super smooth. And wet. Again, if you don't keep the nib in contact with the paper, it's not going to write. I mean, this is very easy to lay down a nice patch of ink. You know, that's a lot of ink. Now that the ink is down in touch with the feed, I don't think we're going to have any, you know, issues. This is a hard nib. So, you know, the bounciness and, and the nice feel with uh, Ultra Flex is not something you're going to get with this nib. But this nib will be consistent. And I would call it kind of like a 1.5B, the 1.0 millimeter. You know, broad is generally 0 0.8, 0 0.9, so this is a little more. So I'd have to admit that if you don't want to mess around, this is a definitely a nib that I would recommend. So you can't see it because it's hidden by the ink, but I took the spring agitator out of just that generic Jinhao converter that's in the 992s, 991s. And now you can see when you turn it upside down, the ink flows down to be in contact with the feed. So the spring seems to work because before when I did this, the ink stayed up there. And even when I tried to agitate it, it wouldn't come down. So here you can see that spring there. So overall, I think I may have solved the problem, but do I go back to the flex nib? The other thing to note is, is that this nib doesn't fit as uh, down as far on the feed as the flex nib did. Um, and it still has good flow and works fine and you don't drag the feed. But of course this nib doesn't flex at all so you're not going to be getting that feed close to the paper. I've worked uh, for many days on this Ultra Flex nib in this Himalaya with Ebonite feed. And I have extremely mixed results. I mean, when it writes, it's a pleasure to use. It's extremely smooth. If you don't flex it, you know, you can get a consistent line out of it. But then the whole point of this is to flex the nib. And it does open up nice. As we can see, it lays down a lot of ink. But it does railroad. And you can get ink starvation in the feed. It just stops writing. And I have the spring in here. I'm doing everything I can do to keep that ink flow consistent. And once it stops, it stops. You can let it set for a little bit of time and it will eventually resaturate to feed and write. So I give this one this 1.0 millimeter nib, I give it a 9.2. I mean it's just ultra smooth using that adjective. And consistent, and that's what you really want in a nib. And I think that's a really nice line. Looks good in this gold Antigua ink. You know, and 
fast is okay. So this pretty much solves that starvation issue that we had on the Ultraflex. So again, another video where I've explored and pushed some boundaries, and I think the key to modern flex is just don't flex it, which kind of defeats the purpose of flexing, but it does make for a soft nib, so if that's something that you like, be my guest. And because I'm used to vintage flex, I might be pushing these more than they should, but that's what I'm here to do, so I can show you what can happen if you do that. So thank you for watching. May have many great writing experiences. Not as frustrating as some of mine have been lately, but hey, that's the fun part of pens. So we've reached the end of this video. May you enjoy your pen experiences. Enjoy your day. Enjoy life. Take it one day at a time. Bye.